Good morning, everybody. Go ahead and grab a seat. Well, don't really grab a seat. Just go ahead and uh, have a seat. How about that? Excited that you're here. Skip, thank you for sharing. Uh, it was a great time in Phoenix. Uh, it was sunny and 75 until we left. And we left and the rain just came down. So it, uh, it was a good reminder of what we had to look forward to when we came home. It was a good time getting together. Uh, I did want to, I do want to encourage you to come to the Art of Marriage Conference if you would like. We're going to have uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship will be out there with us uh, to host a pretty much a day camp for the kids while parents are in here. So uh, if child care is an issue or concern, uh, just come and, uh, and your kids will be well taken care of. Our annual business meeting is next week. Uh, not only is it a time for us to get down to business, but a time for us just to uh, Celebrate what God has done in the past and look forward to what he's going to do in the future. Uh, if you haven't received your uh, annual business meeting packet, you can pick one up on the way out. There's also some supplemental uh, sheets just to, to the right of it that we didn't have available last week. So be sure and pick those up even if you picked one up last week. The way we do annual business meetings here, it is like a family meeting. It's like calling a family meeting. So if you are a member of Good News, uh, you've gone through our discovery class, you've, you said, yeah, I want to I wanna be a member of this, uh, of this body. We encourage you to come. We need you to come. If you've just been checking things out and you want to come to an annual business meeting before the Super Bowl, come on. You're welcome to come. We, we would welcome you to come. Uh, as a church family, the members will, will vote on some things. But if you want to just come and, and listen and come check things out, uh, we'd love to have you there. I think that's all the, uh, all the announcements that uh, I wanted to catch up on. Oh, I did want to mention, if you haven't read in the back of the annual meeting packet, we are uh, recommending Dave Suprak's name to stand as an elder. Uh, Dave has served on multiple ministry teams. He leads a life group now. Uh, so just want to make sure if you haven't read that, just wanted to announce Dave Suprak's name is up for elder nomination. You know, one thing I like about flying is I get to get caught up on uh, all sorts of uh, magazines and books. And I was sitting on the airplane and I read the latest issue of Newsweek. Have you seen it yet? Latest issue of Newsweek has uh, our president on the front and it says the second coming. <laughs> Talking about his second inaugural speech is what the article was about. But it got me thinking, boy, our president sure has a mess on his hands. I mean, our nation is a messy nation, right? I mean, we, we live in a messy place. What are we going to do? Raising the debt ceiling. What do we do? How to protect our kids in schools? How in the world are we going to get out of debt? Do we mint some more money? What in the world is our country going to do? We live in a messy, messy place. And then I started thinking not just about the second term of our president, who has a, a great mess on his hands. He has a, a lot to do, but I started thinking about the second coming of Jesus. And I looked at the whole world and I thought, boy, Jesus has an even bigger mess on his hands at his second coming. And we know that Jesus is going to come back, right? Amen. Right, we know that Jesus wins in the end. Amen. We know that God's plan for the world, as messed up as we are, a world that's filled with disappointments, a world that's filled with famine, a world that's filled with death, a world that's filled with injustice. We know that one day at the second coming of Christ, everything will be fixed. But what about now? We know that Jesus will come back and fix everything at his second coming, but what about now? Because now is where we live. We know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God has our nation in his control. But we still face issues of national debt. We face issues of war. We face issues of our kids being in danger. We live in a messy nation, don't we? I mean, if, it, if you don't, and I'm not, I don't want to get political. I mean, just think about the people that you know. And it seems like people are even getting ruder by the year. Every year, people get more and more 
arrogant. People are parking in handicapped spots and they get out of their car and they run into the store for a quick item. People are so rude they don't even open the door when they should. They, they don't show respect to elders. People are ruder and ruder and ruder. And we know that one day Jesus will come back and no one will be rude. But what about now? And you may be sitting there thinking, yeah, I, I don't claim to be a Christian because some of the rudest people I know are Christians. Maybe you're thinking, yeah, I had a plumber that had a little Jesus fish on the side of his truck and he ripped me off. And if that's you, if, you're, if that's you right now, I'm so glad that you're here. And I'm sorry that you've had those experiences with followers of Jesus. But I'm glad that you get to hear at least the ideal of what it means to live out our faith today. Because we live in a messy world. We live in a world where you seem, you can't trust anybody. Just in the news as I was reading, I read about Lance Armstrong. His interview on Oprah where he admitted to using performance enhancing drugs. Or I read about Beyonce who lip synced the national anthem when she sang it. The military band just stood there and pretended to play, but it was all recorded. We live in a world where we're disappointed by the celebrities that we hold up high. And we see that they mirror the same deception and lies that we tell one another. We live in a messy place. And we know that God is going to come back in the future, but what about now? How are we to live right now? We're talking in the series about point, and we learned last week that we're blessed, so we're, we are to be a blessing. And that's how we're to live right now, but what does that look like? We're going to see today why we are to live differently right now. And I'll give you the short answer, and then we're going to unpack it. The short answer of what Jesus says is this. Live ordinary life extraordinarily. Live ordinary life extraordinarily. Sometimes we think that we have to sell everything we owe and or everything we own <laughs> and go move off and be a missionary in some foreign country. And for some, that is a passionate way to serve God. We think that we have to go and knock on every neighbor's door in our neighborhood, telling them to turn or burn if we are to really do God's work. <laughs> No, Jesus says, live ordinary life extraordinarily. And we're going to see today two reasons that Jesus tells us that that's how we are to live now as the world awaits God's final rule. We'll see in our text today two reasons in a very familiar passage that we are to live ordinary life extraordinarily. Two reasons of why we can take just the normal, everyday, humdrum life and God can use that for his plan. We'll see two ways that we are a piece of God's plan in his rule of the world. It's a very familiar passage. And if you've been around church for any time, you've probably heard this passage. But here's the danger of being in a familiar passage. The danger of being in a familiar passage is that we read the passage and we already think, okay, I know what that means. We're going to talk today about the passage being salt and light. How many of you are already thinking now, oh, I know what this is about. It's about being salt and light. My wife raised her hand up really high. She gets to hear the message several times before Sunday. So. <laughs> but there's a difference, as you would agree, there's a difference between hearing God's word and doing God's word. We're going to hear a passage that's probably pretty familiar to most of you, but hopefully we're challenged to live it out this time because we've heard it before and we still face some of the same problems. So if you want to turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. 
If you split your Bible in quarters and you go to the last quarter of your Bible, it's probably somewhere around there, Matthew 5. If you need help finding it, just turn to the front of your Bible and, and look for Matthew. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing you know, don't be bashful about looking in the front. Some people kind of flip through the front, they flip through the back, and they just don't want to look at that first page. There's nothing wrong with that. Matthew 5. Jesus has been telling people about the kingdom of God and how God's rule in the world has broken through through Christ and God's rule is starting to take over the world. God's kingdom is not just something in the future, but something that's unfolding in the ministry of Jesus. So Jesus is talking about the rule of God. And then he says this to his people, and this is where we get our first reason of why we are to live ordinary life extraordinarily, and that's that extraordinary living is priceless. Extraordinary living is priceless. Living in a manner different than everybody else has such weighty value. It gets people's attention. Let's read with me in the text. And read with me how Jesus says that those who live extraordinarily are like salt, a very precious item back then. Read with me in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste... How shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Salt was uh, very important. It was used to preserve meats. It was used to flavor food. It was an important part of the diet. It would be used in commercial transactions. Salt was extremely valuable. But I was fascinated by that term that says, how, if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? If salt ceases to be salt, it's, it's no longer salt. I, it doesn't make sense. For salt to lose its saltiness, it's like for your chair to lose its cheriness. It's just, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And so I, I said, well, I, I wonder what that could mean. It, it, and I know it doesn't mean that if we lose our, if we uh, don't do enough things right that we'll lose our salvation. This passage doesn't talk about salvation. That's not even an issue here. And I found out that they would take these rocks that were infused with salt and they would package these rocks around meat to try and preserve the meat and, and ship meat. And they would pack this meat in these salty rocks and once the salt had leached out of the rocks into the meat, the rocks were useless because they were valuable because of the salt they contained. So they would unpackage it, they would throw the rocks out on the ground and the rocks would be crushed up and used for other things. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I also found out that they would uh, collect salt from the dead sea that was close by. Sometimes when they would collect the salt from the dead sea, there would be a gypsum mixed in there. And when they would, it, it was hard to tell, but when they would scoop it together, they would take it back, and they would assess it, and they would realize, oh, this is a salt gypsum, gypsum mixture. It, it's not really good for anything. Can you imagine taking gypsum and salt and putting it on a steak? It wouldn't taste very good. And so they would just take it and they would say, ah, whoosh, and they would throw it down on the ground and it wouldn't be worth anything. There's also a saying of the time, kind of like when we say, does a duck quack or does a chicken lay an egg? Everybody knows the answer. Yes, a duck quacks. Yes, a chicken lays an egg. There was a saying at the time about salt losing its saltiness. Like, can salt lose its saltiness? Of course not, it can't. And so, when we read this and we say, how salt, if salt loses its saltiness, how shall its saltiness be restored? The very value of salt is its saltiness. It is either salt or it isn't. You, Christian, are a Christian. Christians act like Christians. Just like salt is salty. And that very acting like a Christian is what is valuable 
in the world. It has extreme value. It gets people's attention. It's like saying, you Christians are like the newest smartphone with an unlimited data plan and unlimited texting that you never have to pay for. You're valuable. Or you, Christian, are like a prepaid spending card, a prepaid cash card that never runs out. That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? If you had a card that was like that, you would protect it and it would be extremely valuable. What do we do with the things that we find are valuable? We pay attention to them, don't we? You know, I have four different hard drives that back up the pictures of my family because I think pictures of my family are precious and I pay attention to them. Maybe you have some family heirloom or some family jewels that you lock away in a safe. You pay attention to it because it's valuable. Some things are priceless. But for everything else, there's MasterCard. <laughs> you remember those commercials? Right? The commercials would say, you know, the cost of something, the cost of something, the cost of something. <gasps> but time with a long lost friend, priceless. Think about it. Yes, taking an hour of backbreaking work, sweating in pain. Doing yard work for your neighbor costs something. But that feeling from your neighbor that someone cares about them and will gladly serve them is priceless. Not speaking up and letting somebody have it because you know you're right costs something. But the ability to make peace in a hostile environment is priceless. Not snapping back at your boss or your coworkers when they chide you for being a believer, possibly even giving you more work or fewer promotions, that costs something. But an employer that sees a faithful employee that practices what he preaches is priceless. Brothers and sisters, taking somebody out that you don't know very well and listening to them instead of just talking about ourselves costs something. Taking someone out to dinner that's a completely different background, a completely different generation, a completely different worldview than you can be uncomfortable and scary. It costs something. But that feeling that somebody listens, that somebody cares, is priceless. <coughs> That's the first reason that we are to live ordinary life extraordinarily, is that our extraordinary living is priceless. In a society that designs all of our goods to be disposable, there are few things that hold significant value. And living extraordinarily is priceless. It gets people's attention. So we are to live extraordinarily, not just because it is priceless, not just because it's what the Bible says to do, but because our extraordinary living, here's reason two, is God's message to the world. The way that God communicates to the world that is in significant peril, the way that God speaks to this messy place is through the extraordinary living of his people. The way that we live is God's way of speaking to this messed up world. What we do can sometimes reflect what people think God says. We are to live ordinary life extraordinarily 
because it's God's message to the world. I was out hiking one time with some buddies, and we had gone out way further than we had planned on going, and the sun went down way faster than we had planned, and we were stuck in the middle of the woods as it got really, really, really dark. I thought, it's really, really, really dark. <laughs> We're stuck. There's no way of finding our way out. With the, uh, the tree covering blocking out all the light from above, it was almost pitch black and getting cold. <laughs> and after a time of fumbling around and we could no longer squint to make out the trail of where we were to head, one of the guys in our group had an epiphany. Hey, I forgot I had a flashlight. And so he takes out this little tiny flashlight on the end of a keychain. But I tell you what, that little tiny flashlight on the end of a keychain seemed to light up the whole trail in front of us, and we found our way out. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> and that's what Jesus is going to talk about next. He's going to talk about how we are the light of the world. All right, we are the light of the world, a world that is plunged into darkness. We are the light of the world. Read with me. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. See, you're, a city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. It's like us saying, uh, when you're driving down I-5, you can't miss Mount Baker on a clear day. Which I admit is sometimes rare. <laughs> but it's like saying, that city that's up on the hill, you guys, you, you can't hide that thing. I mean, you put a big box over it, and you're going to go, I bet I know what's under the big box. It's a city on a hill. He says, you, you can't hide it. Just, they would take these little tiny clay lamps with one single wick. They would take this lamp and they would light it. And because they were, most homes were in one room, they would put it up high on a lamp stand so that the light would spill out into the rest of the room and they could see. He says, the very purpose of a lamp is to shed light to everybody. You don't take that lamp and then stick it under a pot. You don't stick it under a basket. No, the very purpose of a lamp is to shed light. So you too, Christians, in your extraordinary living, you are, have been saved, you have been called God's people to live extraordinarily, to be a light in darkness. And we are to do all of that. Did you see that? So that. Say it with me. So that. Say it again. So that, if you ever see a so that in the Bible, circle it, underline it, point arrows to it, it's a big deal. So that, this whole passage that Jesus has been talking about, there is one reason, there is one point to it all, and it comes after the so that. So that they may see your good works, we like that part, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You're going to get a, a little packet of salt in a little bit. If you really love salt, I guess you can open it up and eat it, but just be sure you don't uh, spill it. I would encourage you to sh hold on to this this week. Hold on to this packet of salt as a reminder that we are to live extraordinarily so that other people would see God. We are a uh, parabolic community. We're a community that reflects God to other people. We do all of this so that this dark, messy, <clears throat> troubled world may see our good works and not think, wow, those people at Good News Fellowship are awesome. <laughs> we are pretty awesome, but <laughs> the people aren't to think, wow, you guys really love the community. Look at you. You're serving. Or wow, you guys really get along. Isn't that awesome? No, people are supposed to see the church and go, isn't their God awesome? They're to give glory to God. Everything we do as a community, individually, gives glory to God. 
Everything we do is not pointed around at the church building or around at any of us. Everything we do points to God. Which sometimes freaks me out. Because sometimes we're not very good at living extraordinarily. Sometimes we don't taste that salty. Sometimes our lights are kind of dim. I heard a, a speaker where Skip and I were in Phoenix, and he shared a, a great analogy of this. He said in New York, there are several different uh, subcultures in New York City, right? There's Chinatown, and there's Little Italy, and he went to name several more. And he said, imagine if you went to Chinatown, and everybody in Chinatown was so hospitable, and they would give you free food, and they would, try, they would communicate with you, and they would always smile, and they would treat you with great honor and great respect. You would probably go home after visiting Chinatown and go, wow, if, if that's just a little taste of what China's like, I want to go to China. Now, imagine if you went to Little Italy. And everybody there is bumping into you and they're pushing you. If you're Italian, I don't mean to offend you. I could have flipped them around. That's fine. But you, you could have been sworn at and, and bumped and pushed and the waiter could have ripped you off and served you water in a dirty glass and the food that you ate was just disgusting and it was overpriced and then you got robbed on your way out of Little Italy and <laughs> you'd look at that experience and you'd go, man, if that's a taste of Italy... We're never going there. Brothers and sisters, the church is like little Jesus. The church is like little Jesus. People that experience us must go, oh, huh, well, I, I guess that's what God is kind of like. And if you've experienced a plumber or an electrician or somebody who claims to be a Christian that has totally ripped you off, that's probably why you don't think very fondly of Christians. Or if you have experienced people who claim to be Christians yet duke it out verbally or slander one another, you probably don't think that highly of Christians or of the God that we claim to follow. We don't want to act that way. We don't. We don't want to act that way. And it's only God's work through us that enables us to act any way else. Christians, the world is desperate, desperate for extraordinary living. There was a survey done that I want to share with you. Uh, this survey was done by the Public Agenda. It was a group called Public Agenda. And here's what they found. They found that rudeness in America actually has increased. They found that 79% of those surveyed said that lack of respect and courtesy is a serious problem in the United States. 88% said that they often or sometimes come across people who are rude or disrespectful. Poor customer service has become so rampant that nearly half of the people surveyed said that they had walked out of a business or a restaurant because of poor customer service in the last year. We live in a world that's desperate for extraordinary living. Rudeness, selfishness, arrogance, pride are all the norm. Deception is standard. Imagine with me if we live extraordinarily. Instead of being late, chronically, all the time, making other people wait on us, what if we lived extraordinarily and we were known as someone who is always on time to things? Imagine how that would get people's attention, especially in the Northwest, where everything starts late. They may even say that you're early. If it starts at 5 and you show up at 5, people may still be setting up for the event. Maybe you can help. Imagine how that extraordinary living would capture attention. Instead of just showing up to an event after you receive an invitation, imagine extraordinary living by actually RSVPing. And I'm just as guilty. I had to RSVP to an event this morning before I preached just so I could have integrity. <laughs> Instead of cutting off that driver on I-5 and thinking that it's okay because they have a Canadian license plate, 
<laughs> Those of you that are laughing, I'm assuming you've done that. Imagine extraordinary living where we let somebody in. Imagine if people saw that Jesus fish on your car and thought of it as a good thing. Instead of trying to cover up our mistakes and save our own egos, imagine extraordinary living. When we pursue peace in our relationships by being the first one to admit that we were wrong. And seeking forgiveness, seeking restoration. Being agents of conflict resolution. Imagine instead of yelling at your kids when they disobey you again in the store. Imagine extraordinary living of kneeling down and talking with them face to face. That would get attention. Instead of letting words just fly out of your mouth when you're angry, imagine extraordinary living by just keeping your mouth shut. And being silent. Instead of just talking about yourself and how wonderful your life is and how great you, the wonderful things you do, imagine extraordinary living, asking questions about other people and really listening. Those are just a few. And like I said last week, those are some pretty easy ones to start with. What I want you to do as you look at that salt packet this week is I want you to ask God, God, how can I live extraordinarily for you? How can I be salt and light in this world? Would you do that? Look at that salt packet and pray. And I want to encourage you every day this week, every day, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, make some time to read what I'm going to close with. This is Matthew 5. It's a couple verses before the salt and light. It's 12 verses before. And this is what extraordinary living looks like. I want to encourage you to read through this every day, 12 verses. Read through it every day and say, God, how can I live extraordinarily for you? Because it gets people's attention. Blessed, Matthew 5, 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall, sh they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, Jesus says. Rejoice. Be glad. For your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. How are we to live right now in this world? We are to live ordinary life extraordinarily. And yes, there are bigger problems in this world. There are bigger problems that we could tackle. But I think living ordinary life extraordinarily is a great place to start. Let's pray. Father, help us. We don't want to live ordinary life. There's nothing in us that wakes up every morning and says, we, we want to just be blech. But God, we desperately need you to empower us with your spirit, to remind us, God, of what it means to live extraordinarily for you. 
Convict us, God. Help us this week as we read through the first 12 verses of how we can apply that to our lives today. God, we love you. We pray that you would use us as a powerful witness for your glory. All of God's people said together, amen.